So over the next few sessions, we cover this topic called discover inner self. You know, at some point we need to all discover, you know, our true self. Uh, so this is a journey. And uh, let's get started with this topic. Why we need to do it? You know, anything we do first, we need to understand why, what is the purpose? So here, um, you know, if you look at our life, there is a lot of science and technology developing in today's day and age. Uh, man has conquered, like we control animals, we control uh, so many devices, you know, communication. We, we got a fair deal of control on things around us. But when it comes to our own mind, we are not there. We like lost control. We don't know. You know, we can't control our emotions. We can't control our feelings. Uh, so there is more incongruity in that sense, especially in controlling our mind. So this topic uh, is to understand, make us understand how to go into our inner self and understand who we truly are. So that will create a baseline for our progress in life. Our, on how we see things around us. Uh, so, in the modern world, the emphasis was less on character, good health, good habits, uh, relationships. So, this this particular session, and in you know the next future sessions as well, they'll give us good foundation on how to cultivate all these things back. In ourselves, right? Because our education, our relations as exist today, they don't cater to this need. If you see, so <clears throat> there are four questions that determine our holistic living. PQ called physical quotient, taking care of body, bodily needs. We all take care of that, and exercising and etc. will keep us physically fit. There is IQ, which helps us, uh, you know, to be good at work. Right. So we all, uh, we all need to have good. We need to, by education, we develop our IQ so that we can be competent in competent in this world, to you know, get our work or anything. So there is PQ, which is to keep our body fit. Uh, and then IQ, which will make us competent in this world. And then there is third Q called EQ, emotional quotient, which helps us build good relationships in this world, right? And then finally, SQ called spiritual quotient, which will connect us to the higher truths. So these are the four quotients that if we balance all of them, if we have, you know, if we put in our effort to develop all these aspects, then we truly live, lead a very purposeful and meaningful life in this world. But often times in this world, the focus is only on the first two, which is physical quotient and what is the second one? IQ, to build our uh, competency in this world. But it does not satisfy us fully from our inside. Unless you have good relationships, can you be happy even though you make a lot of money in this world? We all need good relationships. Uh, if one bad relation, one sore relation in your life can, you all have experience, right? It doesn't keep us happy. Uh, so emotional quotient is important. And more important than is spiritual quotient, which, which in a way, even though all the circumstances are not favorable to us, how can we stay grounded and stay happy in this world? How can stay purposeful in this existence? So that is spiritual question. So this course overall gives us ideas on all these, especially emotional question and spiritual question, which is often neglected subject. Um, so we, so, so the, the, we will discuss these topics, right? Yeah. So first of all, the fundamental knowledge that we derive in this course is who true we really are. 
who are we truly? Hmm? Are we this physical body? Yeah. So we know a car, if it is, you know, if it is there, it won't move by itself. It needs a driver. Means a living person has to enter the car to make it move. Right? Unless there is a living force, there is no movement in this existence. Right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So similarly, our body that we have is a material thing. It doesn't have life. It's jada. Jada means dead. It's the life within the body that drives it. It makes it live and function in this world. So our ancient wisdom, especially Bhagavad Gita, talks about the idea of the spirit within the jiva or the life, right? Uh, life within the physical body. That is the source of, you know, all its activity. That that spirit in the body is called soul. Hmm? The soul is the soul is the one that drives the body. Hmm? Just like a car is driven by a you know driver. Without the car, there is no life in the. Uh, there is no movement in the car. Similarly, the soul within the physical body of us actually drives the uh, the body itself. So, our true self is actually the soul, not the body. Body is just like a covering. It's like an external physical thing, right? We all have seen JCB, right? The JCB is that move things with a huge hand, right? So, the JCB moves large things, but the whole movement is driven by a person who is actually controlling the movement inside the, in the driver's seat, right? So, our whole body is actually is like a JCV and the body, the actual self is the person who is within the heart. Uh, it's also described that soul, which is our true self, actually resides in the in the inner cavity of our heart. So that's the heart is the seating place for the, the soul, the spirit within us. The soul drives the whole physical body, just like a JCB is, you know, driven by the person who is controlling the JCP. Yeah. Just like, you know, hand, if you, if you have gloves and you have your hand in the gloves, gloves keeps moving, but as soon as you take out the hand, glove is, you know, there is no movement in the glove. So similarly, when the soul leaves the physical body, the body is, has no more functionality, right? It just collapses. Uh, it is the life within the body that actually attracts. It's not the, it has any meaning. The body has any meaning only when you have life, right? For example, anything you have, you know, ladies make, you know, decorate their nails, for example. Uh, it's beautiful when you have, you know, when you see the nails, but with the nail polish. But if as soon as you cut the nail polish or the nail and throw it away, would anybody look at the nail? The, the, the one that is cut, nobody. Uh, people spend a lot of time, you know, putting a lot of shampoos on the, you know, on the on their hair, uh, make it like silk, right? But as soon as one hair falls from the head, do you even care it? Even from the most beautiful person, if if, if that hair falls in your food, will you ever, you know, look at it as a pretty thing? No. So as long as there is connection with the living body. There is a meaning and there is, uh, you know, value to it. The nail has no value as soon as it comes out of the body. The hair has no value as soon as it comes out of the body. And similarly, like we all have seen aquariums where beautiful fishes will swim around, right? But suppose the fishes were dead and falling on the floor. Will anybody be interested in watching that? So actually we are attracted to the soul within the living entity. That enlivens the whole thing. That makes it, you know, uh, beautiful. That makes it uh, attractive and everything. As soon as that life is gone out of the bodies, it has no, you know, you can't really uh, relish anything out of it. Yeah. 
So this knowledge of the soul was the first topic that Krishna taught in Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. You all heard about Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it's one of the quintessence wisdom text of, you know, uh, from our Vedic India. It talks about our true self. And this is the first concept Arjuna um, was given by Krishna. And we all know there was this Mahabharata war and before the war began, the, almost the war was about to begin, Arjuna was in a big confusion. Hey, I'm going to fight with my relatives. Is that, you know, is that any purposeful thing? Why should I even fight with my relatives just for the kingdom's sake? Uh, he was totally confused. Am I here to just get the kingdom? And if it is, that's what, you know, the Kauravas want, let me give them and, you know, get out of this. And Arjuna was the prime warrior from Pandava's side. He is like the CEO of the whole battle. And he is here about to fight. And he has no motivation. His Gandhiva bow fell down almost. You can see in the picture here. Right? You see the Gandhiva bow is almost falling down. Uh, the CEO of the, you know, the whole business is almost like motivationless when the war is about to begin. So at that time, Krishna inspires him. Krishna gives this wisdom of who we truly are and what's the purpose of life. And all those concepts, once Arjuna hears all this knowledge, immediately his, his life becomes much more clear. Now he becomes like this. After two hours of Gita session, he becomes like this. Right? He was totally motivated about protecting dharma doing the right thing for the greater goodness of the world, right? So he before that, he was, he lacked confidence, he was fully anxious, demoralized, he is not clear, see, seeing clear purpose, very stressful, very depressed. But such Arjuna, who was completely demotivated, after he in the wisdom of Gita, completely transformed. Like he just wanted to do what, what is the best thing, right? So that's the, you know, that's what the knowledge of Gita can transform bring the transformation in us. Uh, so this is exactly how Gita wisdom can change our own life too. Right? So it's a quintessential wisdom because we all face with dilemmas in our life every day and night. And how do you decide what's the right course of action? Unless you act, you have to levitate your consciousness to a level that you are not, you can withstand any calamities at the ground level. So that's what this wisdom gives us. So the first basic foundational knowledge is, am I matter or am I spirit? Right. So that's what we are discussing. So, uh, so in this session, we discuss these four topics. Am I matter or am I spirit? Our idea is not just discuss Gita Slokas, but actually scientifically see how we are actually not this body, but the spirit. That way knowledge is going to be very convincing, scientific. And you can go back and, you know, talk to anybody in a scientific way, not just, you know, okay, this is from this particular spiritual text. No, not like that. But you have scientific evidence to back what you say. So we learn about scientific proofs for existence of spirit soul and uh, difference between living person and, uh, you know, uh, like a robot, what, what really differentiates between the two. How the mechanism of mind works. That will equip us with a lot of practical wisdom on how to deal in this world. But then, what are the practical benefits of knowing this wisdom in our daily life? So, these are the topics we cover. Hmm? Yeah. So, who are you is the first question. So, there is this scientist called Dr. Harry Mo you know, Monson. He is a professor of anatomy at Illinois College of Medicine. So he says the physical body that we all have is a composition of several chemicals. Right? <clears throat> so the chemical composition is like this. It is 5 pounds of calcium, 1.5 pounds of phosphate, and there is potassium and sodium and all these physical uh, you know, physical chemi the chemicals that compose our physical body. Right? And he also calculated, given the amount of physical, you know, quantity of all these, you know, chemicals, 
what is the value of human body just from its physical perspective and it it, it accounts to be about a few dollars not not worth even a hundred dollars so the question is are we just this physical body worth they say you know twenty dollars we are not obviously we are not from our own experience for example you have a friend who met with an accident he's, he's you know he's coming in a he's driving in a bench car and suddenly there was a huge accident uh, the bridge fell down on it or something and he was almost uh, you know about to die and the car is also uh, you know a bad shape who would you protect who would you take care of first will you take care of your bench car or will you take care of your friend if i ask you who do you take care of first obviously your friend will rush him to the friend but his body is only 20 dollars <laughs> if it is just physical worth it is not really uh, worth taking care of it but we still take care of his physical body because uh, that's what is of more value to us yeah so i can according to mechanics stance is just uh, you know 20 dollars worth but still to take care of the physical body because that is that is worth a lot more because the soul is there within the body ultimately right so that that's what we value truly yeah so we can clearly see that our you know uh, the soul that enlivens the body is the true uh, value that yeah. so here you see the example of a very famous actor who passed away a few years ago. Right? Uh, <clears throat> after that, there is no, you know, all these things like feelings, no desires, no movement, no consciousness. Right? So, Shankaracharya has, uh, you know, a beautiful verse that says like this, you know, Yavat pavano nivasati dehe tavat prichati kushalam gehe, which means as long as there is life, everybody inquires, how are you? you know? But as soon as life is gone from the body, you know, even wife would be hesitant to be, you know, because she's scared, she wouldn't be, she would be hesitant to be near him for a long time. Right? The same person who you loved all your life, who you want to stay close, who you have shared all your feelings, but as soon as life is gone out of the body, that fear, there is a new fear feeling of fear that comes. You, you can't, can you stay near a dead body for a whole night? Even though it's your close relative, all alone, you're scared. <laughs> so, as soon as life leaves the body, your attitude towards the, the body changes completely. The person changes completely. So, it is truly the value of the, the soul within the body that we are truly connecting at any time. It's not the physical body that we are attached to. If you see all this, right? Yeah. Once the soul leaves the body, body has literally no value. Right? Within a day or two, we, you know, we uh, take the body to crematorium and decompose completely. Yeah. So you can see here, there is this beautiful Bhagavad Gita verse, Na jayate mriteva kadachin, nayam bhutva bhavitava nabhuya, Ajo nitya shashuto yam purano, na hanyate hanyamane sharire. For the soul, there is no, neither birth nor death anytime. The soul's characteristic is that it just changes the body. As soon as this physical, in this current body, as soon as the duration is over, it just moves. Just like we change our dress. So suppose I am wearing this dress today. After a few years, like in a year or two, this body, this dress becomes, you know, worn out. And then what do I do? I just change, right? So similarly, the soul, as long as the body is fit for it to exist, it will continue to exist. And as soon as the body is unfit for its existence, it will just move on to the next body. So the soul has no depth. It continues to exist or, uh, you know, changing bodies. So this is further knowledge of the soul. Right? For the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. Yeah. So now the difference is between a body and the soul. Because we are now understanding that soul is our true self. Body is just a dress. 
we want to really understand what are the difference between the two so that you know we can deal we can understand you know the characteristics of the soul and act on the platform body is material made of physical elements matter soul is anti material it's not physical you can't see you can't you know touch you can't feel it's not conceivable to our physical you know uh, indriyas or you know senses but it's an entity you, you can understand conceptually for now to realize we need to practice meditation that will you know it's a journey of lifetime we are now just discussing theory part so understand that it's a anti material element right non physical element so body is matter soul is spirit body is dead or non conscious soul is conscious hmm? for example if i pinch you on any part of your body you can immediately feel because the consciousness of the soul is spread all through the body right so ima imagine like soul is like a small light bulb its light is spread all through your body okay its presence is felt the soul's presence how do you know the presence the soul is present within the body because you have consciousness if i pinch you anywhere in the body you can immediately feel that's because the consciousness is spread throughout the body from that soul within the body just like there is one sun within this universe that lightens up the entire earth for example right this is one bulb just like the light of the sun is spread all through the universe so similarly the energy the consciousness of the soul is spread all through the body physical body so that's a good analogy for us to understand so as soon as soul leaves the body will you be conscious can i pinch you and can you feel that no it's it's no more conscious so body goes through changes soul has doesn't go through any changes body is a temporary thing because temporary thing means its form changes right nothing physical remains the same way it is its form keeps changing the elemental parts remain the same but today something is in the form of a home tomorrow it's all land again third day it becomes a conference hall the physical composition keeps changing our body today is it's in so and so physical structure elements remain the same but over a period of time it decomposes and becomes part of the earth and again in you know in a future body can transform to some other thing so the elements remain eternal but the composition itself is a temporary thing right yeah? the soul is an eternal entity the real self is actually an eternal thing means it existed forever in the past and it will exist continue to exist uh, so that's the difference between what is physical versus what is uh, spiritual conscious body is dead soul is alive yeah so who we are we all look at our you know our face all the time in the mirror but actually we are not that what we see in the physical in the in the mirror though we identify if if i ask you who you are you will generally tell your name right but actually is that our true self as long as we are in this body yeah maybe for this lifetime you may be called with that name but as soon as you change the body to the next in the next life you won't be the same right so you are not the body that you see in the mirror but actually you are the spirit you can see in the picture there there is a <laughs> there is a person sitting in the uh in the in the region of the heart it is just a you know demonstration to make us understand it's not truly really exactly like that but uh the soul resides in the region of the heart so that just like a jcb we discussed right jcb is a hand has a hand that moves things but actually the jcb driver is controlling from inside the jcb right so that picture is very similar to the physical body is being moved by the direction given by the soul within the heart in the physical body yeah yeah so here uh, if we live only on the materialistic point of view which most people in this world are right we are we understand that we are just bodies made of this material elements and 
right? We are just a chemical bundle, right? Everything is finished at time of death. So these are this is our understanding of life. If we don't have the wisdom of Gita or the spiritual wisdom. But actually, the spiritual point of view, we can see that we are not just a physical body made of this, you know, flesh and bones. We are actually the spirit soul encased within this material body. Yeah. And we also understand this wisdom that we don't just die. When we die, you know, we are not just finished completely. That's a very reassuring wisdom. For example, we all have loved ones in our life. We have parents whom we love the most. We have our siblings. We have our, you know, cousins, brothers, uncles. When we understand that, you know, when they leave us completely, you know, in this life, lifetime relationship, when we understand that we can continue to pray for them, they exist in that, you know, that spiritual form in various forms, then that's reassuring wisdom because that gives us so much strength of right we we are not re, we are just only physically separated just like now we are in a different country from our country of birth but still we know our parents exist or relatives exist in some far away place that's reassuring because we know they exist some somewhere in some form right uh, but if we understand only if we if our understanding is only at materialistic point of view where everything finishes at life at death that's very hopeless way of you know seeing this world because we can't really you know relate to people who we lose in our life right that's very uh, discouraging view of life but the spiritual viewpoint gives us an understanding that you know there is the spirit that drives all the life forms and that spirit is eternal and we also understand more characteristics of it it's so reassuring. We all know that, you know, all our, you know, family members, they all are eternal. Whether in, you know, in this life or in the next, we can always relate to them in one way or the other. We can always benefit them. We can pray for them. We can, you know, uh, wish well for them, wherever they are, right? So this knowledge is so reassuring, right? Yeah. So in the... So the analogy to understand about life is we are like a, you know, like a bird trapped in a cage. You see the bird, there, the lady there. Most of the time in this world, we only cater to the needs of the body. Right? We try to take care of our health. Uh, you know, in many ways we try, you know, we eat food, we exercise, but we do we ever take care of our inner self truly? In this picture, the lady is taking care of the case. She's painting it nicely, decorating, but not feeding the bird inside. So the bird is almost falling down. It's very weak. So similarly, if we only live at the understanding that we are this physical entity and we have no understanding of our true self, we only cater to the needs of our physical body, we are like that loyalty who actually is not taking care of the, the true person inside the case. And eventually the person would become very weak, the like this bird here. And unfortunately, they will not be truly really happy. The whole purpose is to make the bird happy, right? It's not the case, decorate the case. So similarly, if we don't nurture our true self, we can't really be truly happy on this analogy, right? Because if we only take care of our physical needs, how can we truly be happy? If we don't cater to the emotional needs of the our true self, and if we can't take care of our spiritual needs, right? So, so this understanding is very important. This, this will help us actually cater to the needs of the soul, at least think in the direction. Yeah. So not knowing their real identity, People spend all their life polishing the case, pampering the body without feeding the soul. Yeah. Yeah. That's not good. So now we understood the difference between who we are, the soul, and you know, what the difference between matter and soul. 
let's see some you know scientific proofs on the existence of the spirit soul yeah so the first principle is common sense we all can understand from a common sense principle so we we discussed all these four uh, you know topics here common sense and consciousness and ndes ob's and reincarnation research so here you see a picture of a dead person lamented by relatives and whenever you you know you talk about a dead person what do you say hey this person passed away do we ever say you know is that how you say we always say but who the person is there who passed away did you ever think huh? passed at no i passed down ah uh, passed down yeah passed down or passed away we say you know the the body, the soul left the body that that's what we try to say but the physical body is there the the composition of the body is same you know the chemical composition is exactly the same as he was when he was living but now suddenly we say the person passed away so what really left the person if you ask you no know, the soul has left the body right so that we say you no know, person passed away yeah so in <clears throat> so through our common sense we can we actually relate that we are not this physical body we are something beyond the physical body just by our common sense the way we relate right <clears throat> so even when we relate to our own body right we say do we say my hand or i hand my hand my nose my hand my my legs my body if i say my body who am i truly yeah so in you know our common sense dealings itself we think that we accept the fact that we are something different from our body that's the reason we say my body not i body you see so through common sense we can understand the way we relate to our own body uh, we can say that you know we are not truly actually our body yeah so we all know <clears throat> suppose there is a camera watching a, a physical movie right it has ability to capture the scenes and a person is watching what is the difference between the two a person watching a movie an emotional movie go, you know orchestrating some very positive scenes or negative scenes he would say marvelous he he has certain feelings that he will express so there is as soon as and when the movie goes on there is some some thinking around it some feeling around it right thinking feeling all these things will happen in a conscious living entity but a camera watching the same thing doesn't go through those emotions correct do they they record as it is so so consciousness is one aspect that differentiate between what is living versus uh, what is dead right so one may ask i go through these emotions but who is going through the emotions did you ask hey, is my i going through the emotions i am watching something i am absorbing some waves you know some physical waves through my eyes that knowledge is taken to my mind and physically supplied somewhere my i is just a physical device absorbing these pictures taking this and presenting to some witness within my body and experiencing this but who is the experiencer did you ever ask i am watching if my eyes are physical device my mind my you know this whole nervous system is a physical device all the signals are going through my eyes but where is this expression of oh this is beautiful coming did you ever ask yourself what could that be now with the knowledge that we have the spirit within the self right so the spirit is the true witness for all the observations that we make in this world so that spirit that consciousness 
is the one that is actually the real you know for all of this you know all the things that happen in this world so dead matter is non conscious now there is this near death experience uh, there is a you know one professor by the name michael sabom he actually did thousands of you know research on thousands of um, case case studies where he observed this phenomena called near death experience where people go through a physical trauma very physical hardship and in that experience at some point they leave the physical body and experience as a witness from outside the physical body like for example he was being operated at the heart level that person he is unconscious almost on the you know his pulse is almost like you know person who is dead there is no pulse but this person for a for a brief time like say a few minutes was out of the physical body and witnessed the whole thing and actually he was able to relate to what was being talked about by the talked by the doctors there what exactly they did what they cut what they did so there are like thousands of case studies that show where the the person within has been out of the body for some time and again went back to the body and could speak about what has happened during the whole uh, period when he was actually supposed to be completely unconscious getting operated on the in the in the operation theater so there are many many case studies like that so that shows very clearly there is some entity beyond this physical body that is actually you know witness like otherwise the person is completely on the you know on the on the you know hospital bed unconscious being operated how can he talk about what the doctor spoke during his operation so there must be something that is not the physical body that has to come out of the body to experience that and explain explain that so there are you can go on you know you can go on your mobile and look for this this is a, this is like a you know proper scientific evidence the recorded evidence yeah hmm Hmm. Yeah. 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 Speak a little loud. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. And Why people what she told me, like when she came out of body and she was able to see there is a bright light behind her, but she was not able to turn and see that light so quickly. And then she was able to hear and see like what people are doing with the body. And they said, okay, she's gone. And then moment after that, she came back and she told that people, this is what you guys said. And everybody asked, yeah, this is what I said. Right, that is very common. Right. right. Mm. So just like recently, now, she just wanted to share. Also, I mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. So Prabhu shared uh, just now, uh, you know, a person who actually came to our festival in, you know, in Seattle here, Anandamela, where that individual had this near-death experience and she shared exactly what happened during that period. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is scientifically, you know, we have seen so many evidences here. And these are recorded evidences. These are verifiable data. And, you know, uh, so we have so many books about this. So you can see the books here, out of body experience, right? Uh, several books with a lot of evidence data, you know, hundreds of books. So this clearly shows that there is something that is beyond the physical body that exists. And this is 
Ian Stevenson. This is another type of research. The, the other one is near death experience and out of body. This is reincarnation research, where a person in one form existed at some point in time, and he existed in a different form at a different time, completely. Uh, yeah. So, so there are about three thousand spontaneous reincarnation cases <clears throat> where people, you know, have explained. I I'll show you a couple of examples here. Uh, so this 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 is again like totally research data, and he has put down uh, you know uh, like all his research in you know research papers. You can all read you know the links are given there, uh, you, or you can search by Ian Stevenson name. So this is proper scientific data where he had thousands of cases of reincarnation, where people lived at some point in some form, and in the next life before age 10, like between generally 5 to 10, they exactly remember who they were in their past life. And they can even take people to that place. Like they could relate to their previous life's wife or husband, father-in-law, mother-in-law. Like I'll show one example right over here. So a couple of examples we show. So And again, there are like so many books on this. So what is common between the current body and the next body? There is something that is common. There is, if these two are like two data sets, there is some element that is common between the two that is relating to both the bodies or events of both the bodies. So that's the soul. Right? So, yeah. How come I don't have the video? Yeah. You know, there is a video I can share online later. Yeah. Uh, many people have phobias. They fear certain things. Uh, so that phobia, Ian Stevenson says, it actually originates in their previous life. For example, somebody was killed with a knife. They will be very scared of knife in their next life. Or somebody is very fearful of water because they, they died. Because the, at the moment of time, uh, at the moment of death, if they go through very, uh, very big emotional trauma and die, like somebody fell in water and you know out lack of breath they died and they got, went through a lot of physical trauma that marks very strong impressions in their mind which gets carried in their next life so people who go through such traumas in their next life they will have these strong phobias against those yeah so these were all you know he had Ian Stevenson has case studies of people like this, and he had recorded exactly what happened in their lives. He had done all the research. Yeah, I'll share. Hmm. Yeah, are you part of the WhatsApp? Yeah, okay. You will we'll share this presentation. Yeah, and another thing is sometimes, you know, twins are born, you know, with the same genes but the personalities are quite different and Ian Stevenson says that is also because there are two souls in these two bodies there is not just one soul so physically they may have good resemblance but they are two different personalities because two different souls exist within the two bodies Yeah, even though they are identical twins two different souls so naturally there is uh, two different uh, um, like contrasting temperaments. Yeah. So you can actually, let's watch this for a, you know, it's a couple of minutes video worth watching it. They have the same name and boyish good looks. James M. Houston, raised in the Midwest. James M. Leininger, a young boy from the Bayou. There's something in the eyes. It's undeniable. That's not all they share. Somehow James Houston's spirit has affected my son, either through reincarnation. I don't know how it happened. I can read the Japanese easiest part. Initially, um, what caught my attention was James's extreme fascination with airplanes. And every night he slept with his G.I. Joe action figures, which he named. 
I took him to the Kavanaugh Flight Museum. Here's home video. While the other kids casually look at the plane, two-year-old James seems to inspect it. Watch as he checks the underbelly, then climbs inside, donning the headset. I said, oh, look, there's a bomb on the bottom. He said, that's not a bomb, that's a drop tank. Bouncing about in the cockpit, James was flying high. That night, their world would change forever. He started having the nightmares, and that was my first indication that there was something wrong. It was a panic-stricken, terrorized screaming. Over and over again, James had the same terrible nightmare, four to five times a week. He was too young to explain the dream, but he could draw. Bombing ships, you see men parachuting. Here's another one where planes are dropping bombs. Help me. He would just be crying. It's the airplane crash on fire. A little man can't get out. He laid on his back and kicked up at the ceiling, and he goes, Mama, the little man's going like this. And he laid on his back and kicked his feet up. The little man's going, ooh, 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 can't get out. And I said, well, who's the little man, baby? And he goes, me. I thought Bruce and I were just going to faint. They questioned, what kind of plane? Or Sarah. Why did your airplane crash? My plane was shot down. Who, who shot your plane? He looked at me like I was a, a village idiot. He said, the Japanese. And I kept thinking... Where is he getting this? I was a stay-at-home mom, so I know that there wasn't anything that he was being exposed to. Not exposed to in this life, but perhaps, just maybe, somebody else was. Decades earlier, James Houston grew up with the same insatiable fascination with airplanes. He became a naval fighter pilot and fought in World War II. March 3rd, 1945, during a mission near Iwo Jima, he took a direct hit at age 21 was declared missing and presumed dead. Where did he take off from a boat? Do you remember the name of your boat? He said Natoma. Found uh, several thousand hits on the word Natoma. The USS Natoma Bay launched into battle, headed for Iwo Jima in the fight for Lady Gulf. It's the biggest naval battle in the history of the world. Leo Pyatt served on the ship. From his home in Ohio, he organizes the Natoma Bay reunions. That's how Bruce found him. I wanted to disprove it. He asked uh, a few questions about, uh, did I know some of the people? Oh, yeah, I remember those people. And uh, so he he got uh, very uh, quiet. It was all real. The people and places James described actually existed. And remember those G.I. Joe dolls that James named? Turns out three men with the same names, first and last, served on the Natoma and were killed in action. James said they greeted him in heaven after his crash. I'd always asked him, do you remember what your name was? And he always said James, but his name is James. Yes, there was a Jim Houston, or rather large shell, just hit him in the, the engine and it burst into flames and, and went down. They showed Leo the drawings. He was uh, right on the nose. I'm sure, in my mind, that he was there. Leo invited James, now three, to the reunion. James recognized several pilots, even called them by name. You're Bob Greenwald. <laughs> I'm serious. He never met Bob Greenwald. No, he'd never met him before. And someone else was invited. James Houston's sister, Anne. And he goes, uh, it's not Anne, it's Annie. She wasn't my oldest sister. I had an older sister than that. And I said, you did? Who was that? And he goes... Roof. I mean, roof. Eddie is what they called me when I was little, knowing my name and my sister's name, the things that my brother did when he was a kid. It's too amazing to, to describe how he would feel that, that way, but he does. He considers me his sister. But does she consider James her brother? I think it's probably a reincarnation of my brother. <laughs> Suzanne Stratford, Fox 8 News. You can see here. Yeah. Very good evidence, right? <laughs> you can clearly see the physical body. So the soul is the same between the two bodies here. So there is another story here. Sukla Gupta, remembering her past life. I'll just quickly glimpse through. Yeah. Yeah, so when she was, you know, around five, six years, she remembered her past life. 
uh, you know, her past village called Bhat Bhatpara. She wanted to take all his current family members, his parents and everybody to show her past family and, you know, past village. When she was going, she would tell her, tell the, you know, family members how exactly to reach her, you know, past home. And once she went there, she could identify every individual there. About 20 things she identified. She was directing all the people there. And once she goes to the home, she actually identifies her, you know, different relationships. Who is the mother-in-law, brother-in-law, uh, indicated who her husband was in his previous life. Uh, so another clear evidence story, right? That reincarnation is the truth. So these are, you know, the sayings of various scientists on this topic. Benjamin Franklin, you can see here, finding myself to exist in this world, I believe I shall in some shape or the other always existed. Yeah. So this is what great philosophers say. So we have seen, you know, very clear evidence of the soul, right? Now we'll go discuss the differences between a per living person and robot, you know, just to, now that we are convinced, yeah, there is the spirit soul, we want to understand a little more about what's the difference between a you know, living and dead. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell me what to do. Yeah. I think we discussed this. If suppose there are a bunch of judges watching this versus a you know a camera watching this. Camera, we can clearly see the differences, right? Camera has no experience while the judges have experience. Camera has no emotions. Judges have all these emotions. Camera has no consciousness. Judges have consciousness. Uh, camera cannot judge while judges can judge, right? So that's kind of differences between the two. Yeah. So once Swami Prabhupada was asked by, you know, a journalist, hey, uh, Swamiji, what, you know, isn't the body just, isn't the self just a complex physical entity, just a device? You know, what really differentiates between me and a you know a any physical device right so why should we bother about some soul powering the body so that was his question right so this is the answer Prabhupada gave he asked you know first to convince him hey you are not this physical body but more than that a physical body doesn't grow for example a car doesn't grow but a human body or you know any living entity's body grows right the body goes through six changes where matter doesn't and uh, right so two bodies can come together to generate a new body for example uh, so there is not no such thing that the two physical devices can do just a differentiation between the two yeah so these are the major differences between a living entity versus a robot. So the living entity goes through six changes. It is born, it grows, it stays at some, you know, in some position and then produces some byproducts and dwindles and withers away, right? So the six changes go through in a living entity. And living entities can multiply. Missions cannot multiply. And living bodies have Consciousness means thinking, feeling, and willing is there, while matter doesn't. Yeah. So these are the transformations that living body goes through. Yeah. So now we discuss some mechanisms of mind. How you know what exactly is mind? So our true self, you know the. Like we, we have multi-level existence. The gross physical level is the body that we all can witness, see, experience. And within this gross body, there is a subtle body. 
the subtle body is composed of our mind and intelligence and ego, the identity factor. And then the true self is still within, that is the, the Atma or the soul. Right? So these are the three entities. The grass body is composed of the five material elements, earth, water, fire, air, either. The subtle body is composed of subtle elements, mind, intelligence, and ego. And the, the self is Sat, Chit, Ananda. That's the nature of it. Right? So, eternity, knowledge, and bliss. The mind is how mind operates. Mind is a coordinating sense. It operates through all these, we have these five senses, ears, nose, through which we acquire knowledge in this world. All this knowledge goes through a coordinating sense, mind. Mind observes, you know, you see and you know, you, you perceive the perceive it, and that knowledge is taken through mind. So mind becomes the repository of all these memories, experiences, and our desires. Through them, it also generates desires. So it's a uh, it's a repository of all of this, right? And what is intelligence? One intelligence is one level higher faculty. That gives the that gives us the discrimination power. So through all the wisdom that mind has, mind has this repository of knowledge. Intelligence is the one that decides based on the knowledge what it should do. Right? So that's the intelligence factor within the body. Suppose our senses are driven in various directions, uncontrolled. Mind, you know, or say, you know, the tongue wants to eat some things, foot want to walk somewhere, eyes want to, you know, see some things. So all our senses are directed in various ways. <laughs> all the time, like for example, when we watch a TV or, you know, phone, mind is being, you know, driven by various things because various things try to attract our attention. So if our senses are being driven in various ways and our mind is unstable and uncontrolled and you know all all the time distracted then you can't be you can't achieve anything because your energy is you know split in various directions diversified right so a controlled mind means ultimately who deciding whether to go in this direction or in this direction is the faculty of intelligence it helps us go in the you know in, the, in a chosen direction if the intelligence is weak, meaning if you don't have good discrimination power on what is the right thing to do at any point in time, based on all the inputs you are receiving in through senses to your mind, then you may not do the right thing because you are being distracted by the inputs from your mind. Right? So the goal of this spiritual education is to strengthen our intelligence to sharpen our intelligence so that we can use our discrimination power to do, to direct our energies in the right way, in the right direction, to control your mind and ultimately your senses in such a way that you can be very purposeful in your life. Right? The whole purpose of yoga is to actually con get control over your mind. Right. So right now, in current day, day and days, we have more and more things being you know, given to our mind, right? Our senses, our senses are exposed to too many things. So much we watch in our mobile, right? So much, so much knowledge is being uh, absorbed all the time through various senses. But how do you achieve what you want to achieve in life? It's not possible when your mind is being distracted in various directions. So we need a, you know, a level of control on uh, our mind. And that will be possible only when your intelligence is strong. Because intelligence is the one that is deciding based on all the inputs that is received at mind. So, study of wisdom texts like Gita will actually strengthen our intelligence. or It's called spiritual intelligence. Or we spiritualize our intelligence. Yeah. So intelligence is the decision maker. Mind is the storehouse of all the unfulfilled desires, thoughts, and experiences. Senses, you know, help us absorb various 
experiences in this world, right? Ears help us hear nice music. Tongue helps us taste nice uh, food. So in this way, all the various senses provide the inputs to your mind, right? So the control should be, right now the control is reverse, meaning the senses are driving in various directions. Mind is running behind them. Intelligence is like, you know, I'm out of control. <laughs> Ideally, the, the order of, you know, hierarchy, the hegemony should be in the other way, where your intelligence is so strong that it can tell you, hey, mind, focus on this. And mind will control the senses fully. So the example of charity is given in the wisdom text. Here, you know, the horses are like the senses. They're running in all directions. Mind is the rope. Mind is the only thing that can control the horses, right? Yeah. The ropes. And intelligence is the driver. Driver is the one who controls the direction of the chariot. And the soul, the self, is sitting in the chariot. This, you know, now, if the senses are completely directionless, imagine how bewildered the soul is. Right? This is exactly what we see in these streets here. When people lose control on the senses, they abuse their body. You can see they are like, they don't know what to do completely. You can see the reverse. When senses take over, soul is bewildered. When intelligence is strong enough to I can control the horses now. Then your life is in a much more directed path, right? You can achieve anything in your life. Yeah. So Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, this specific verse where he says, mind is your best friend or your worst enemy, right? So for him who has conquered his mind, mind becomes your best friend. But for one who failed to do so, mind is your greatest enemy. You may have everything in your life, but if your mind is not you know, stable, then you feel depressed in, with all the things that you have in your life. Yeah. Yeah. So can mind be controlled? Definitely it can be controlled. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just like a knife can be good or bad, right? A knife in the hand of a physician helps to cure disease, while in the hand of a miscreant can kill a person. So similarly, when mind is controlled, it can help achieve many things. It can help many people. Uh, it can be a you know positive addition to this world. But if it is uncontrolled, it can be a big threat to the, you know, world. Yeah. So what we put in our mind determines our quality of life. If you always keep garbage, all negative thoughts, you know, uh, negative experiences, you know, you watch negative things, you experience negative things all your life, then it's like garbage in, garbage out. What you put in is what you get out. You put good things, you could get the good things out. Right, So that's why we should control our inputs. The books we read, the friends we have, the movies we watch, you know, the music we hear. So all these things matter because they determine the quality of life. What you put in what is what you get out. Hmm? You see in our college days, you know, people, we have seen people who get habituated to smoking, right? Because they think smoking makes their life cool. <laughs> but we all know our mind says okay let me experience this intelligence says no it's not good for you do you think it is good but if if mind is overpowering intelligence he would go and try it that's how people get into these bad habits why would they try these things because mind has overpowered or the senses have overpowered mind and mind has overpowered intelligence but if you're intelligent enough you say, hey, no, I know this is going to give me diseases, this is going to spoil my entire life, and I will not do this. If you are very fixed in that, then you can't be, you know, spoiled. Yeah. So understanding mind is very helpful in navigating our life in a better way. 
so now we discussed all these aspects we we discussed who we are we are you know not this physical body but a spirit within we discussed a bunch of scientific proofs on the existence of soul we discussed the difference between matter and you know uh, living person mechanisms of mind now let's discuss some of the practical benefits of this knowledge in everyday life today's world we see lot of division over caste creed and you know country all these war because our color all these are because we relate to each other at these physical relation physical realities like i am born in certain country i am born in certain you know sect caste all these are actually temporary once a person who knows this knowledge hey these are all just temporary things there is nothing to do with your true self if i fight based on my shirt uh, you are red and i am wearing green you are my enemy is that not foolish that's exactly the truth is about you know this kind of wars because we are not this physical dress this physical dress is just a temporary arrangement if we if we truly live at the level of the soul if we truly understand that we are not this physical body but the soul within then we can relate to others in a universal brotherhood way right so all these differentiation you know are sometimes some one person may be beautiful or may be ugly we don't feel too proud because we know body is temporary <laughs> neither we feel too depressed because we don't look good right somebody is too fat they don't need to be depressed because they understand that they are not really truly that physical body yeah so all these physical differences or physical gaps that we have shouldn't or maybe somebody is rich somebody is poor we don't feel depressed by any of these physical conditions once we have this knowledge because we under, truly understand our, our true identity is spirit spiritual and it is eternal this body is just a 70 year term it's just like a flash in your eternal journey right how much do we really finicky about this one flash lifetime right even if you have everything in this world or you don't have anything how much is just like a flash in this entire journey of your soul why should you be too much bothered about it right so that you start operating at that level of wisdom and you are not bothered anymore about this physical gaps that you have right you can uh, just like as a child you may be attached to a toy but as you grow out of it if somebody takes away your toy will you be unhappy no because you have grown out of it so similarly the knowledge of soul makes us grow out of this you know physical relation physical way of dealing this world once you start operating at that level you don't anymore be you know uh, depressed about the physical lack of things or you know things that you don't feel too proud about what you have also right so in 2016 uh, there was a you know 50 year anniversary of iskon we have a a very large temple in in uh, mayapur where it's called world headquarters of iskon and uh, on this occasion the whole world was invited means those who are practicing spirituality specifically the way you know the iskon movement has prescribed and about people from 126 countries came together on that day who were all practicing spirituality that was the first time so many people of various you know designations and countries have come together in such large numbers before that there was another occasion where our prime minister modi who brought several people across the world and at that time that was a guinness world record and the number was 106 and when you know we are celebrating this reunion 126 countries people have come and they are all jolly happy and you know working together 
and at the time you know guinness record was about to be broken and uh, our institute people they called modi you know modi sir we are about to break your record should we go a little low should we say <laughs> should we limit ourselves to 105 modi said no this is grand great you know you are uniting the world together so break my record i'll be happy that you are breaking my record <laughs> so you know that was the new record at the time yeah so we grow above inferiority complex because all the inferiority complex are because of our physical differences on what you have and what you don't have right so all these differences won't be there because you start working at the soul level right and soul has abundant potential yeah so you develop positive attitude you develop tolerance patience considering everyone to be potentially good you start seeing good in everybody yeah yeah we start relating to not just humans we start relating to all living entities because in every body there is soul even in cow's body there is soul even ants body there is soul we don't want to harm anyone then with this wisdom you start living like a person who is the well wisher of everybody not just humans around us yeah so in summary we discussed all these you know concepts are we just uh, you know matter or spirit discuss all these concepts and then we discuss scientific proofs differences between living entity and robot mechanisms of body You know, gross body, subtle body, and soul—three levels of existence. Yeah, and then uh, we discussed uh, the practical benefits of this knowledge. We can live, we can have universal brotherhood with this wisdom. We can rise above our deficiencies, and we can develop very positive outlook towards our life. Hmm? We can also, you know, this is the mind map. I'll oh. share this picture as well. So. we discussed all you know in detail some more details are given here right started with introduction then we discussed am i matter or spirit and then scientific proofs common sense consciousness nde and obe out of body experiences and reincarnation research by ian stevenson then we discussed about what is the difference between living person and a robot and then we discussed about mechanisms of mind the three levels of existence of human human or any any living entity and what a gross body is composed what a you know subtle body is composed and what the spirit is composed so we all want to live forever do you agree right we all want to live nobody wants to die yeah. at least experientially nobody wants to die where is the desire to not die come from did you ever question that is coming from the soul there is always desire to acquire knowledge why are you studying in university where is that coming from that is also coming from the soul the desire to acquire knowledge the desire to live forever and we always seek happiness in this world don't we whatever we do the underlying principle is i want to be happy i want to minimize my misery and i want to be happy correct so that's why the soul's nature is sat chit ananda sat means i want to live eternally nobody wants to die in this world chit means i always want to seek knowledge in this world always we are always in pursuit of knowledge correct and then we always want to be happy we want to minimize misery increase happy happiness so this is all because that is the nature of the soul right sat chit ananda sat chit ananda sat means eternal chit means knowledge and ananda means happiness blissfulness so that's the nature of our true self what's the point of gathering knowledge what's the body that is mm -hmm. so knowledge is not that important why is this ah that's a very good question yeah gathering knowledge being happy 
are even living because if you did not die, so why is it so bothered about such a thing? Knowledge seeking is the nature of the soul. And knowledge is actually part of the mind. Mind is a subtle body. And the mind is actually carried to the next body. For example, we saw the video. That person remembered all his past experiences. Yeah. But the nature of, no, what we are discussing at that point is the nature of seeking knowledge is coming from, is, you know, is sourced in the soul. The, we are just understanding the nature of the soul. Of course, lot of, and again, the mind actually keeps all these memories. It's just locked from, you know, most of the, because if we try to remember all those old experiences, we, we can't just uh, live, you know, peacefully. That's the reason the knowledge was locked for a purpose. But knowledge itself exists. The nature of mind always, you know, the nature of the soul is a, you know, is a constant factor. It, it always seeks knowledge. We are just trying to understand the nature of the soul. Yeah. Yeah, it, it may not, you know, we may lose all that knowledge that we gain physically, especially in this world. But that nature is what we are discussing. And that is a consistent thing. Like we always seek knowledge. We always want to live forever. We always want to be happy. It's because the nature of the soul is Sat Chit Ananda. I hope that makes sense. Right? Yeah. Okay. So that's the end of the session. Um, I'll just stop recording. Any other questions online?